Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Nicholas, I'm the minister here, and it's lovely to have you with us on this beautiful day. And I'd just like to welcome all of you who are watching online. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, lovely uh, to have you with us. Um, today, we've uh, got a special... I mean, we, did you like the 50 outside? Did you see it on the... It's quite nice, isn't it? So we're really starting to celebrate our 50th anniversary, and... Um, uh, we've had all our heritage forums up to now, and today we're going to, as part of our reception, just be celebrating the garden. Shelley, do you want to come out here? And Shelley's just going to, Shelley Merriam, who's our historian here, who's really been a lot to do with uh, putting together our 50th anniversary. Do you want to tell us a bit about what we're going to do in the garden and what's uh, available? Yes, I have a few announcements, but do we celebrate these surroundings every Sunday, but especially today? The gift of these windows, this architecture, what we share here as a community. And it actually starts before, even before the roundabout when you first catch that glimpse of that vertical tower. So we're gonna be celebrating out in the garden today too and I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about that. But I want to be sure some of you have already passed the test and you get a gold star back there because you've already read this handout on the, <laughs> the chapel history. And I hope when others of you have time, you will do this. Greg Anderson wrote this beautiful history of the garden, and uh, it really enlightens, enlightens us. Um, it actually didn't, um, it, even though it was in the original design by Hennigan and Gale, um, it became a seed of an idea of, um, of Greg Anderson and other important people that I'll mention in a minute. Ten years later, and then it didn't actually start happening until 1984. And before that time, you pulled your car up out there and left it and walked in, pretty much. So it wasn't such a welcoming place out there as originally envisioned and designed. But we're going to be celebrating that today as well. So, um, And also take a look at this. We're so excited. Our Heritage Forum Committee has been working for, gosh, many, many months. And um, our plan was to... Uh, to fill four events, and with the garden it became five events, um, to really visit our history and our heritage and have a better understanding of our surroundings, who came before that contributed to this wonderful space and experience that we share. And um, the final event for the Heritage Forum Committee is this 50th anniversary concert, which is next Saturday, July 6th, and it'll be at four in the afternoon. And that's chosen for many reasons. It's a it's a big weekend for participation, but also the light we expect to be wonderful, although we can usually count on it any time in this space. Um, Susan has created an incredible program that uh, really reflects the Beatitudes, which were the inspiration for these windows, um, and the famous artist Jean-Jacques Duval, the Frenchman, uh, and his technique. You'll learn more about that. Michael Onmont, Aspenite, will also be here. And also, I've just heard... Um, the Andersons, who were the first couple married here, uh, before actually it was officially dedicated, um, they're going to be coming next Saturday too, and we'll have other special guests. So please join us and with a wonderful reception following. Information is here for you. Uh, Heather McDonald asked me to uh, mention that for the gala that's coming up in August, um, <clears throat> she's looking for photographs of the chapel community events, services, workshops, anything to, that will be featured at this event. Um, she's also looking for someone to photograph the original photographs uh, with their phone and send these digitized images to her so they can work with them as a part of preparing for the gala event. So if you can be in touch with Heather, if that works for you. Um, we're celebrating the, the garden, as I said, and I just want to share a bit of history with you. Um, as I said, this piece that's included is written by Greg Anderson for reflection in your own time. But we also honor the generous contributions of Bob and Dee Dee Ray and la landscape architect Greg Mosian in 1987 when they were energizing this garden concept and bringing it to fruition. We also today want to thank Greg Anderson, Tom Ward, and Karen Cordes, uh, who I think cannot be here today, So, um, which we're we're sorry about, but anyway, we'll send our love to her and Heinz. For three decades, over three decades of service of these three people for developing and caring for this garden. And a special thank you today, too, for Karen Cordes, Michael Eisner, and Gracie Oliphant, and her crew from Victor's Lawn and Garden for their generosity and their commitment to ready the garden today for our 50th anniversary summer celebration. So we look extra, extra fine fettle 
uh, for our 50th summer. In his youth, architect Fritz Benedict experienced a connection to Frank Lloyd Wright because he was his gardener. He was deeply influenced by Wright's philosophy that architecture should blend so completely into the landscape that they become one and the same. No house or building should ever be on a hill or on anything. It should be of the hill. Aspen architects Hennigan and Gale, working for Fritz Benedict, were also influenced by this Wrightian organic philosophy of design that they expressed and manifested that philosophy in the Aspen Chapel, being one with its surroundings. The Aspen Chapel experience begins not in the sanctuary, not here. You've already experienced it. It happens before the roundabout with that powerful vertical rise of the French Wayside Chapel design inspired tower framed by the snowpack ski runs calling in the distance. Nearing the chapel, as you come around, the horizontal grounding of this building from this side invites entry, inclusion in nature of the site and the garden. The waterfall softens, the stone benches beckon, the rounded marble sculptures invite one to meander the grounds. Deer linger in the shadows, birds observe, observe quietly in the trees. The wood, the stone, yes, even the copper drain pipes speak of a chapel grounded and of nature. And the light of the portico calls us, move along to the side of the chapel, observing those vistas and layers, mountain strata millions of years old, but yet they're a part of us all. And humility becomes our awareness and gratitude our prayer. Reach for that handle on the door. Welcome all a spiritual home for everyone. Wander, pause, reflect, and honor the gift of our chapel garden surroundings today following the service. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you for all the hard work you put into uh, just a round of applause to Shelley. And I see Karen is here. It's nice to have you. You can see people wearing badges saying, ask me about the garden. Uh, and they're the people that will know about the garden during the reception. Comes from, remember in the 80s, lose weight now, ask me how? But anyway, ask about the garden. Okay, so I just want to say a couple of things happening. Uh, tonight, Dawn is going to be doing a sound meditation tonight. She's got all the gongs, all the bowls. She'll have it all out. All the chairs will be up 6 o'clock. Do come. It's really a very transformatory experience, so uh, do come along to that. Um, Tim's doing the Zen meditation tomorrow morning, uh, uh, Tim Cooney. One thing, normal week, one thing I do want to mention, Thursday, 4th of July, we're in the parade. We have a Bill Hunt is driving a flatbed truck with an eight-foot thing of the, the chapel in it. So do come along and be on the truck, if you want to, waving at everybody. We're going to form up. It's be at 10 o'clock. We're going to line up. The parade starts at 11. We'll be in Main Street. So just come along and find us, lined up with the rest of the parade. Uh, and then we're going to just move through as part of the parade on Thursday. So it'd be great to have you there. Uh, help with the float. Uh, uh, do we need... Sure. Yes. Uh, uh, Heather here, will, will, that'd be lovely uh, to have some help with the float. We could bring decoration. We could stick it all on. It'd be great. Theme is peace. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we've got the concert uh, on Saturday. Be, be aware of that. And then next Sunday, we've got the monks here. So do come along for that. We've got the a whole... Uh, monks will be providing chanting and, and stuff like that. It'd be an amazing thing just to have the, uh, the monks here. And then just be aware that... In, uh, on, uh, on the uh, 13th and 14th, we've got the Thomas Keating uh, legacy celebration. So do uh, come along to that. And you can see all the rest of the stuff. Don't forget the Bach Cantata is on the 28th, uh, that Sunday, the 28th of July. Uh, we've got Matthew Fox. More about all that sort of stuff uh, later. But uh, do have a look at the, the things that are coming up. So I'm not going to embarrass you, hopefully, but I just want to ask, is anyone here 
Is this the first time you're coming to the chapel on a Sunday? Just put your hands up. Go. There we are. I've just got a, a, a few little goodie bags for you here. So who, who is there? Just over here. So Susie, would you just pass behind you? Who else? Uh, someone at the back here I saw. Yes. Now, there is chocolate in here, so don't leave it out. Oh, two here. No, I'll give you two so you don't fight. Here we are. Okay. Anybody else here for the first time? Oh, nearly uh, took over. Anyway, we just like to say, always really appreciate people who come along and try us out. So on behalf of us all, we just like to say a very warm welcome. And thank you so much uh, for coming for coming with us. Um, absolutely great. So, um, without any further ado, uh, we're going to have our, our first piece of music. Uh, now, we've got uh, Robert, who's, gonna be, who's our oboist, and he's going to launch us off, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to let our children go. Michelle, do you want to come up and tell us what we're doing, uh, what you're doing downstairs uh, with the children today? Thank you. Good morning. Um, we are in the spirit of the garden party today, or the garden reception. We are talking about sacred spaces. And obviously, we're sitting in a sacred space today, and the garden is certainly sacred, and this whole valley has so many sacred places in it. And so bringing awareness to kids that there are places that are human-built that are sacred, where people gather and learn wisdom from one another and celebrate together. And then there are places that are quiet, that are more contemplative, and those sorts of places that are sacred for us, where we find our inner wisdom so that we're ready to share it in the bigger world. So that's what we're talking about, and we're meeting our children where they are. We have a lot of young ones today, so we may not delve deeply into that topic, but <laughs> <laughs> the essence of that will be there. So. Thank you very much, okay. Michelle, great. So uh, if you'd like to go with uh, uh, Michelle, that's great children. Thank you very much, lovely to have our children with us today. And just the rest of us, I always think it's a good idea just to take a bit of an audit of our lives, um, just to see where we're at at the moment maybe with our eyes closed.
maybe just notice whatever is going on with your mind at the moment. The thoughts you've brought in. Thoughts you've been having this week. Thoughts that are still maybe going on now. Getting a sense of where you're at with your life. Noticing the commentary that's always going on. And let's just make a decision together today to really focus on just being here this morning. That any thing we see or hear will be able to touch us deeply. And in the spirit of that, let's just drop down from our minds, putting our attention into our hearts, into that place of love, that place where we connect with each other through open hearts. We come together and form a community with our open hearts. And we open our hearts also to that divine spirit, which is at the center of all things. We come here to celebrate that spirit, to celebrate each other, to celebrate the beauty of the earth. O love divine, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, come and cleanse the thoughts of our hearts that by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Amen.
just going to invite Phyllis to come and read to us. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Robert and Susan, for that beautiful and inspiring music and for everyone to be here for this uh, wonderful celebration, this beautiful summer morning. The reading is from uh, the Bible, from the New Testament, from the book of Luke, verses 20 and 21. Once, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. So this is the second in a series that I'm going to be doing uh, on the Lord's Prayer. Um, and I'm talking about the Lord's Prayer not as something that one just mumbles when one's in trouble or in a service or something like that. But I'm, I'm talking about it as a dynamic series of affirmations, if you go through it, that leads to awakened consciousness. I'm suggesting that's what this is, a dynamic series of affirmations that leads directly to awakened consciousness. Now, the version I'm using in talk about it, uh, I put it in your service sheet. It's there. It's the one that was given to me by a biblical scholar years ago, John Pettival. And the, the, way, the version he uses goes, Father of us, the one who is in the heavens, hallowed be your nature. May your kingdom come. May your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Give us today our bread from above that gives our whole life meaning. Cancel our debts as we cancel the accounts of those indebted towards us. And let us not be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And I'm going to repeat a few things that I said last week about it, just so those who weren't here. Because some of you don't come every week, I gather. Um, so I'm just going to keep you up to speed, uh, those of you. I said before that... I started my own personal meditation practice with this series of affirmations. And it really, every, you know, for the last 40 years, I've used this. I used it this morning. And it, I find it such an important set of words. And as I said, Jesus gave it to us because they lead us step by step to that place where the portal opens. The portal opens to the kingdom of heaven. And I put that little graphic at the top of the page, which comes from uh, the film Stargate, which starred Kurt Russell of this parish, and James Spader, who got together. And they had to get these, get together these set of hieroglyphs that they found all the way around the world. And when they got it all together and all the computers worked out with NASA and all that sort of business, suddenly they put it all together and a portal opens. And they're able to go through to another dimension. I said last week, the film is less interesting after that. But, you know, that, that is the way that I look at the Lord's Prayer. It is an opening of a portal. It, he gave us these words to be able to open the portal within ourselves to have the kingdom of heaven. And I'll just give you a quick blurb, as I did last week, as to the way it works. This is how the portal works, just in general, just to put it in context. So, Father of us, the first line, that acknowledges that the universe is a friendly place, that there is an other to relate to, and that other has a loving disposition towards us. So Father of us says that there is something else out there. The one who is in the heavens, that places that other in relationship to us in our lives. It is within us. It is all around us, like a sponge living at the bottom of an ocean, with the ocean all around it. You know, we are like that. So we are in the divine presence. That's what we're going to be speaking about today. So Father of us, the one who is in the heavens, hallowed be your nature. That puts us in relationship to that supreme being. Literally, may your being be regarded by me with a sense of reverence. The only way you can respond to that divine nature 
is by reverence. So it's father of us, the acknowledgement. The one who is in the heavens positions it within us. Hallowed be your nature. That is my response. May your kingdom come. May your loving nature order all things. May that loving nature of purpose come into all things that are here. We give up to that wisdom and love. So we're giving up to may your kingdom come. May your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. May I be a part of that opening. May my beingness join with the beingness of that divine nature to be a part of that solution to the world. Wherever you are, you bring your perfection. So bring your perfection into my life. Give us today our bread from above that gives our whole life meaning. May I see the meaning that my life has. May I see the bigger picture and in so doing know what to do in any situation. Cancel our debts as we cancel the accounts of those indebted towards us. You know, anything that I've done or I'm holding on to, may I just let go of it. And may I let go of anything, any forgiveness that I need to around me. You just, may I just be completely in that present moment, not holding up to anything. May I, let us not be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. May I not be put into situations where I have to choose between my own way and the way of that divine nature. May I not fiddle around with trying to make things happen. And may I not be touched by the evil intentions of those around me. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. For everything I participate with my life comes from you all power comes from you all thanks for everything i receive now and forever in this present moment that lasts for eternity in this present moment that lasts for eternity so you can see that when you say those words your mind is in a place where that portal can open and that is the purpose of the prayer is to bring you to that place where you're able to participate in what he calls the kingdom of heaven, which is whatever it is, enlightenment. It is the process. It's a life's work. You can't just say it. You know, sometimes you can just say it and just boom, it's there. But it is a life's work. It is participating in that. And um, um, last week we looked at that first line, Father of us. Just using that phrase, as I said last week, is transformatory. Using the phrase, Father of us, is transformatory. It's transformatory because it affirms the existence. There's a wasp here, so we'll just uh, let it go wherever it needs to go. <laughs> it is all part of the divine nature and the garden as well. So, so anyway. So, Father of us, you, you, you know, you're really saying that phrase is transformatory. It affirms the existence of others. It says that there is a universal mind there for us to connect with and be part of the solution rather than the problem. There is a wisdom out there that we can be in touch with that will allow us to transform our lives and the lives of those around us. That's that first phrase. And then we go, the one who is in the heavens. Father of us, the one who is in the heavens. And really, that's what we're going to be talking about now. And this is as close as the prayer comes to, to defining the divine nature. The prayer defines the divine nature in saying the one who is in the heavens. It positions that divinity, divinity from the Latin word divus, which means God-like. It's not even saying that is God, it's God-like divinity. It positions that as being existing within us all. It says that divine nature exists within us all, which is how Jesus saw it. You know, the coming of the kingdom of God does not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is. He's quite clear because the kingdom of heaven is within you. He's saying this is where it exists. This is where Jesus places his experience of the nature of reality. You know, he, said, he puts it on the table and he says, this is what it's about. He doesn't talk about a God in the sky. He places the existence of the ground of all that being within our midst. And I think it's quite interesting, the traditional version says, you know, our Father who art in heaven. And your mind immediately goes to old man in the sky. Our Father who, it takes us completely in the wrong direction. It, it, you know, we think of an old man in the sky, you know, we pray to Jesus up there probably as well, it's going to come down. You know, that's where it takes us. And it's not what Jesus is saying. And, you know, this understanding of the kingdom of heaven is within you is what places Christianity, it makes Christianity an Eastern religion. 
You know, we'll talk about that a bit more next week when the monks are here. Because he asked people to, to realize that the kingdom of heaven is all around them, like an Eastern religion. That heaven is actually this world clearly seen. That heaven is actually this world clearly seen. And you know, he, ref- he reinforces that idea in John, where he says, because I live, you also will live. On this day, he says, you will realize that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Now, that is the clearest definition of unity of consciousness that I've come across. He says that I am in the Father, I exist within that, that divine nature, you are in me, you exist within that divine nature within me, and I exist within you. We share that divine nature. That is a description of the kingdom of heaven within us. So what he's saying is, father of us, there is an other that we have as a supportive force in our lives, the one who is in the heavens, and that force is in us and is all around us. We are like a sponge in the ocean. We exist in our own right, but that divine nature is all around us and in us. It supports us and it gives us everything. And yet, like the ocean and the sponge, we're not aware of it because we're so close to it. The sponge isn't aware of the ocean. We're not often aware of it because we're so close to it, because it's always there and we forget its presence. The line says, the one who is in the heavens. And once again, that stresses that oneness of everything, the unitive nature of consciousness. And yet, most of us do feel separate from everything else. You know, rather than feeling like a sponge floating in an ocean, we often feel like it's us against the world. You know, Nicholas Contramundum. You know, it's us, Cindy, whoever it is, with the whole world against us. You know, we are separate from the whole world. And that's because the purpose of our rational mind is to help us survive. The purpose of this, the rational mind, is to help us survive. And in doing that, our mind, all our minds have convinced us that we are separate from everything else. So we can work out what to target and make sure that we survive. You know, because if we're separate from everything else, we can, I'm targeting Barbara now because I know she's coming for me. You know, and I can then, then actually, I'm separate from her, I will target her and help her survive. So the feeling is not like we're a sponge. We're not like a sponge in the ocean of love. That's not what life feels like. We feel most of the time, here we are, we feel like our backs are to the wall. You know, there's us, and then there's this huge bubble that's out there. And we are at the edge of that bubble. And we're looking out into the world with our backs against the world. and Everything's coming against us. And we can see this enormous bubble all the way around that we actually are having to deal with, that comes to us. And we, this is the experience that we have at being the edge of this bubble. That's different from the feeling of being a sponge that lives in the ocean. You know, we battle to keep everything else at bay because it's coming to get us in one form or another. We're driven by the fear of what might happen. And this has reached such an overwhelming level in our societies that whole industries have grown up to support that fearful view. You know, our justice system, immigration security, the militarization of states, nation states, has gone so far that much of our economy is now driven by the industrialization of that fear. That fear has become industrialized. It drives our economies. It makes the world go round. All of it, all of which, though, comes from the false premise that we have our backs to the wall and that everyone else is coming to get us if we're not armed to the teeth. But it's all based on a falsehood. And that falsehood is that we're separate from everything else. When, in fact, we are all party of a oneness that is embodied by an ocean of love and us being that sponge within the ocean. 
when I think about that, one of the things I've always wondered is the sheer vastness of what's out there. You know, you're, you've got your back to the wall, you've got that bubble, but when you look out there, it's so vast. According to current thinking, the observable universe is about 93 billion light years in diameter. The, the, the observable universe is 93 billion light years in diameter. And when you think that a light year is the distance that light travels in one year, and in one year light will travel 4.88 trillion miles, you just get a sense of the vastness of what's out there, 93 billion of those. And you also get the sense of the sheer impossibility of connecting ourselves as a tiny thing of being the least bit significant because we've trapped ourselves into thinking that way. You know, here we are against the, against the wall and we've got all that huge vastness and we're just like this insignificant little thing. We have created ourselves, each of us, as the mind in the iron mask. Each individual creates themselves in their lives as the mind in the iron mask. Our minds have created this. In defending us, our minds create an iron mask that goes over our heads and makes us think that we're separate from everything else. Looking out at life through these tiny little slits in the iron mask to the mind within. And we're also backed up against a wall. We're not even free in this life we leave because we see it as being that huge bubble which we're looking from the outside in on the very edge. The mind in the iron mask creates that illusion. Back to the wall, huge bubble going out and each of us being insignificant, looking out into the world that's going to come and kill us at any moment. So our mask protects us and allows us to hide behind it. But if we take off our masks and stop being the mind in the iron mask, it actually transforms our experience of life. Not only do we open to being a part of all creation, but the back of the mask in coming off actually makes us, you know, the mask when it's there thinks that we're at the edge of a bubble, where in, in reality there's so much more. There isn't a wall that we're up against. We're limited in our experience of the world only by observe, observing it through our rational consciousness. Our rational consciousness makes us feel we're up against a wall because there's only our mind thinking about all that stuff going on out there. But actually, when you look at it, when you stop analyzing everything from your rational consciousness by taking off that iron mask, we open ourselves to, first of all, our body consciousness. That's the next thing we're conscious of and then our racial consciousness, and then we become conscious of our planetary consciousness. And ultimately, this is what Jesus is talking about, we become conscious of the universal mind, that universal consciousness, that is the one who is in the heavens. And in doing so, the whole universe opens up. You know, there may be billions of light years out there that's observable, but there's also billions of years of consciousness in here. Each of us, the cells that we all have, the atoms that we all have, have a memory of 13.7 billion years. Remembering is the aspect of bringing that stuff in. Now, we don't remember all that. We don't, it, when, we don't bring it to consciousness because we're totally in our rational minds. But that consciousness is there. That consciousness is, makes, is what makes a plant know how to germinate. That consciousness is what knows how a leaf to grow into a tree. That consciousness is actually within us, and it is deep. It is as deep inside us, that 13.7 billion years of consciousness is as deep there as it is going out into space, the, the billions of miles of light years into space. It goes in both directions. If we were to plumb the depths of what we could possibly be conscious of within, it would match what we're conscious of without. We are not at the edge looking in. We're actually in the middle of all consciousness. We're in the middle of the universe. We're part of the universe. We're the universe made conscious of itself. So there is the broad breadth of huge billions of years of consciousness, and then there's what we're conscious of out there. And throughout history, 
we've gradually become more conscious of that. You know, from being a single cell organism, conscious of other cells, to being microorganisms, to being conscious of the air and dragging ourselves out of the sea, to being conscious of other animals, to finally being conscious of ourselves as human beings. That is how consciousness has evolved. And we are part of that evolution of consciousness. And now we're not only self-reflecting, but we are becoming aware of father of us. We're becoming aware of father of us, the one who is in the heavens. We've been able to see into space and gradually realize the immensity of that space. And now we are beginning to see into consciousness, into the ground of our being, and see the immensity of that space, the one who is in the heavens. We're not right on the edge, but we are in the middle. We are that sponge in that ocean, a part of the one who is in the heavens. And by not being the mind in the iron mask, we free ourselves to be able to float in that ocean of love. Love, giving with no expectation of return. That's what love is, giving with no expectation of return. The universe is given with no expectation of return. We are given our lives with no expectation of return. To float in the ocean of love is to become part of that love and our lives to be a gift to others with no expectation of return. To live our lives floating in that ocean, not trying to get anywhere or to acquire or to protect ourselves, but to become one with the one who is in the heavens. That is the true experience. And the experience is like the experience of being lost in music. You know, those few times when we're dancing, and you're completely lost in music, completely. Your body moves with the music, you go with it, you move around, you're not aware of what's there. That is the experience of being that sponge at the center of the universe, to be lost in that experience of living our lives. That's why life is referred to as a dance. And, you know, Jesus, the whole thing about Lord of the dance, Onto the last page, so don't panic. If you're thinking, when is this going to end? It is never going to end. <laughs> We're just going to be here for all eternity together. So you're lucky you picked this lot to be with. Anyway, so that's why it's Lord of the Dance. It's a flow that we give up to that includes all of consciousness, all that's out there, and all that's going back through time. Now, you might say that, you know, Jesus was, you know, 2,000 years ago. And we still seem to have not got very far in 2,000 years. But the thing is that in the nature of evolution, which is 13.7 billion years, 2,000 years is actually a blink of an eye. You know, we're just starting as humanity. You know, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna... Lao Tzu, Muhammad, the Dalai Lama, Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, Thomas Cranmer, Zen Master Dogen, Meister Eckhart, Julian of Norwich, we're all the same generation. This is one generation. It may be 2,000 years, oh, it's a long time. No, we're still in that generation. This is happening now. And it's this iteration of consciousness that we are in has only really just begun. It is new, and we are at the cusp of this evolution of consciousness. And if you think that's too otherworldly, oh, absolutely ridiculous, then, you know, that there are practical considerations that we have to get on with life, and I just want to remind you of the nature of perspective, because that's what we're talking about here. You know, when your perspective is that your house is on fire, then your purpose is to put the fire out. When you see that your house is on fire because we are under attack from aliens, we're under attack from aliens, and the world is about to come to an end, then to hell with your house, there's a much bigger game to play. You have to look at the perspective. You know, size matters. The bigger your perspective, the more you can get a handle on what's actually going on in life and handle it accordingly. You know, a meth addict's perspective, a meth addict, their perspective is just to get more meth. A concerned parent's perspective is to look after their kids. A corporate CEO's perspective is, you know, whatever corporate CEO's perspective is. Each of us has a different purpose to our lives, and each of us acts out of that accordingly. And I'm not telling you how to live your lives. 
I'm challenging you on your perspective. Because when you realize that there is a father of us, and that this one who is in the heavens is amongst us, and that you are part of that heavens, intimately connected with everything else through your consciousness, being connected with the universal consciousness, when you get that, it might just give you pause for thought and help you inform the assumptions that you make about your life and the decisions that you make about your life. That's why it all matters. It's not about being otherworldly because your perspective on life is what drives you. Father of us, the one who is in the heavens. Let's pray. So we give ourselves into that wonderful sense of being part of the heavens and we simply ask, may your will be done. May your kingdom come, may your will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. We ask that we may be a part of that solution. People who don't experience joy or peace in their lives, people in prisons, in hospitals, people in difficulty, people in unfair regimes, people in war zones. We ask that we may be a part of the solution to that. And we pray for those in our own community who are suffering, that we may be a part of their help. We pray for Rita Hunter, who's got Lou Gehrig's disease at the moment and is suffering with that. Pray for Penn Munro, Mimi Schlumberger, Pray for Don Windhorst, whose father's recovering from surgery. Pray for Heinz Cordes, recovering from surgery at the moment. Pray for CP's family struggling with Lyme disease, his, her brother struggling with cancer, and also um, Michael Eisenhart struggling with Lyme disease. Pray for Penn Munro and Mimi Schlumberger. We offer ourselves to be part of their healing. Amen. So we're going to pass the plate round just from the sublime, the <laughs> ridiculous. And just, you know, we offer the plate because, you know, that's where we uh, get our funding. We'd love to, to, for you to be generous. We've got lovely music just to encourage you. Do please uh, give to us. We're uh, most grateful. Thank you.
Robert Dias. Thank you so much, Robert. I so appreciate that. And Susan Nicholson as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robert. So while we're doing this little series, I just want to give you just an opportunity just to experience that, uh, that sort of sense of meditation with, that, uh, with those words. So just if you're open to this, maybe just closing your eyes. And just see if you can go with the flow of this and just get a sense of that, those movements towards that portal opening. See if the words can take you. Father of us. the existence of other, the one who is in the heavens, in our midst. Hallowed be your nature. May your kingdom come. May your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. May I be a part of that. Give us this day our bread from above that gives our whole life meaning. May I experience that meaning in my life. Cancel our debts. Forgive us what we've done. As we cancel the accounts of those indebted towards us. Let us not be led into temptation, but rescue us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. I just finally I came across this lovely poem that, uh, from uh, Cold Mountain Poems by Han Shan, which just sort of expressed this idea of the kingdom of heaven being within our midst. This is from Han Shan. Green water in the stream in the pass, white water risen from the clear welling spring, Han Shan's moons of flower, white as well. So the darkest secret, the spirit of itself illumines. Gaze into the emptiness, to the ends of the earth. You're alone. All is within. Do join us at the end of the uh, service outside in the garden for reception. But just because we're celebrating the garden and it sort of fits in with all the themes, we're going to sing this lovely hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth. Let's stand.
So may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. Amen.